about that. So one of the key things, let's just look at this again, the, one of the things that the Magile, um, Magile, that's a new word, Manifesto for Agile, they're looking at individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. Basically, they're after freedom, weren't they? They're after yeah. freedom. Um, they're looking to say, how can we free ourselves from the constraints of the organization, the constraints that this is the way that we've always worked? Yeah. <clears throat> how easy is it just to get freedom? Well, freedom is great, right? Um, yeah. Look at my profile. I love freedom. Mm, absolutely. Um, it, I may not contribute within the field or within the area that you want me to, but I definitely love my freedom. And I think that's one of the key issues when we talk agile, uh, that when we talk about freedom, uh, it's not about individual freedom because you have the whole team. You need to fit your way of freedom into the whole team. Mm -hmm. And um, when, when we talk people over process, which is great and really is uh, one of the things that help people really get forward with, its, uh, with, the pro uh, with the projects. It also says that we actually need to put in the effort to make the people able to use people over process. And that's where I think that uh, building fits in 100% to uh, agile. I would even say that some of the things that uh, they, these clever IT guys came up with in 2001 may resemble a lot of what Meredith said in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, okay. So I think taking the perspective when we talk agile and just say, okay, now let's forget it's a project. Let's forget it's uh, uh, the, the, what we're working on uh, and all that. Let's just focus on how can we as a team be ready to do what we want to do? How can we as a team be ready to have freedom or as Patrick says, autonomy? Mm -hmm. um, what does that uh, require from us for us to get that? Uh, I had a couple of years ago a good talk with a salesperson who actually said he loved his job because he was able to be as free as he wanted. He could do whatever he wanted. Nobody followed up on him and nobody cared where he was as long as he on a continuously basis uh, met his targets. So he knew as a salesperson, he needed to sell to get the freedom. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about a team needing to get the freedom or the autonomy to work as they want to work, uh, they have to give the insurance or they have to give the, uh, the, uh, the people depending on them, the, the perspective that they are actually able to deliver what they, they think they are gonna deliver. Uh, because it's not just saying, okay, you can come do whatever you want at whatever time you want. Um, so I think that's that's the key issue that we talk about when we talk about being agile or when we talk about being a team. Uh, so having, and that's, I think that's the main, main point that what we're talking about today is um, this is team. Making agile work is about the team. It's not about the skills as uh, within uh, as certain software development or uh, being able to do whatever. It's about the team. The team makes the agile possible. Um, so that's why I think that Belbin is basically a requirement to be able to do agile the right way. Uh, I know a lot of agile uh, uh, courses or training courses they talk about uh, Tuckman and uh, Norman Storming for it and so on. But what I see is needed and what I've seen over the years that I work with the different agile teams is actually that the knowledge of each other, the knowledge of themselves and being able to share that is what really makes them go through the Tuckman process quicker and be more ready to actually live up to the manifest the manifesto of uh, agile teams because just giving them the, them the manifesto and not giving them, them, the, them the skills to actually work together that's that's not going to be a success i've seen that a lot of times yeah when people just say over to you 
you know, self-contained team, self-managed team. Yeah, there you exactly. go. So in a fact, in a way, what we could say is that for that freedom, for that autonomy, we need to do quite a lot of work before you get there. That's not a given. Mm. You need to be able to put the work in so that each un individual understands each other within that team for mm. that to become more successful. And you've used this um, with organisations. You've got, had some great um, case studies. We were chatting um, the, the other day. Did you want to talk us through how you've been able to sort of help a team go from that quite structured, rigid, this is the way we're working as a project into more of a fluid team that was able to react um, to the environment? And, you know, the role of the manager as well within mm. that because um, I think, you know, how we all work together and I think, you know, that really does, does have an impact, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, I think the most important thing when you start to working with, with, with an agile team is to get a sense of what is the trust level. Um, mm -hmm. Are they comfortable working together? Do they know uh, what they can ex expect from each other? Do they, uh, do they depend on each other? Uh, and uh, is that mutual or are they working in smaller and smaller teams within the team just to make it work. Um, so the, the first thing I usually start out with is, is a, a, a short building session where we start out with their own profiles mm -hmm. and uh, they get to present them the, their own profile first. So each uh, team member will present their own uh, building profile uh, with the focus on what they think is the the good stuff in the profile. So what are my strengths? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and how do I want you to communicate to me? Uh, or how should you communicate to me to get me to perform the best with you? Uh, just let them put some words on it and, and see what they can get out of it. And when they've done that, they can uh, then go in and uh, the other team members can can contribute. They can say, "What did I see, or what do I see in, in when we work together? Mm -hmm. Which strengths, and uh, how does that compare to uh, how I expect you to work, or how we talked about we should work?" And then they get to really get into the profiles, mm -hmm. how we work together, and 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 uh, what's important for me and what's important for you. And that's just on the team level. And then you can start with the manager uh, and see how can the manager, and either the scrum master or uh, a project director or whoever it might be, um, which, what, what's, the, uh, what's the profiles that you have in the team mm -hmm. and how can mm -hmm. you uh, leverage them to actually do better and be more comfortable about themselves okay. um, and, and the, uh, the team members. So with that, and I don't can't believe I'm being this because I'm being a bit complete to finish it here, is um, when you say people doing their profiles, it's important, I suppose, and I think Belbin gives you that perspective. Do you tend to just look at the self-perception or do you also add in how other people see them? Oh, observers is key. It's key. That's key, yeah. Okay. Uh, I would say I, I only do 1% self-perception profiles. 99% are, are with the observers. So, especially in this case, because we want to know what other people uh, think that we are contributing mm -hmm. in, in the relationship that we have. Uh, so, just giving uh, that chance to give that feedback is extremely important, especially in a short uh, project where you need, you need to get up to speed as a team really quickly. So, you need okay. that feedback. Yes. You need it it's in a, a structured way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and yeah. then you can uh, address it if you think it's wrong or if, uh, if you want them to see something else. But you, in a constructive mm -hmm. and, 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 and structured way, you actually get the feedback really quickly and can act, yeah. can act on it. Yeah. yeah. And that helps, doesn't it? And if you're asking somebody, so once they've got their reports in front of them and then you're asking them to present their strengths to the rest of the team, areas that they'd like to potentially work on, how they like to be managed. You're giving that ownership back to the individual as well, aren't you? You're giving them the control. You're mm. not um, forcing a methodology on people. People no. have got their reports and they're choosing what they're, they're showing back with the team. I quite like that. 
I think that's key, especially when you're starting out uh, in a team. Give them the control of uh, of their their profiles. Give them the control of how they want to present it, uh, and then start the feedback process. And, and also, in in a more mature uh, team, it works. If you have uh, let's not say conflicts, but disagreements and and tensions get high sometimes, and so on. It's a very good way for people to just manage how they go into that uh, discussion about what's not working. Uh, for instance, I had a, a team where uh, there was especially one person who the others found very difficult to work together with. And when he presented his profile, he said, I, I have these strengths. I, I'm a monitor evaluator, I'm a shaper, and I really like to work this way. And I appreciate the feedback that you give me, but I would appreciate it even more if you waited to give it to me until I asked for it. Okay, and, yeah. And just by saying that, he actually just diffused the bomb because that was what happened. What was happening was always that they, they saw that he could do something else or they meant he could do something else and went into him and, and told him that. But he, he didn't need that information yeah. at that time. Yeah. Uh, no, so that's the kind of uh, dialogue you can start off in that. So, for instance, if you're in an agile team and you, you need to be able to address changing situations, you need to be able to, uh, if, if the uh, project owner has some different uh, ideas they want to work on or some other uh, stakeholders uh, comes, come with some input, then you need to be able to handle that. And if you as an agile team should uh, can uh, can do that in a way that you are prepared in advance and agreed yeah. in advance how you handle that, that would cause you way more less stress. Mm. Uh, I don't think that if that's correct English. No, no, that's uh, fine. Way that's less stress. Good. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, in the team as as uh, and as an individual team member. Yeah. Uh, because. You prepared for the the unprepared uh, intrusion, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, going back to the freedom uh, question or uh, autonomy, you can get the freedom and autonomy and get success with it even more if you are prepared for mm. doing it. So, the more you're prepared to what can happen, the more you don't have to rely on actually having a plan to follow. Makes sense. Okay. No, it does. So what you're saying, if I'm if I'm getting this correctly, yeah. is to say the more you do the upfront prep, yeah, the more freedom and autonomy it gives you further down the line. And then you don't need rules because then no. you already have all of this is, is in place. But it's not a given, is it? And I think no. this is sometimes, you know, if like we do this with an agile team, off we go. It requires, as all teamwork does. And this is why teamwork is in whatever capacity is so blinking difficult because it requires a lot of work up front and it's something that is never done. It's something that it continues and it's ongoing and we need time to reflect, don't we, that how things are, are going to go. And like you said, with the conflict, it's wonderful is that you think, well, this is how I let's not get to conflict in the first place because I'm telling you how I prefer to work, how I prefer my feedback. Mm. But I, one of the teams that I work with actually, uh, so, so in Agile, when you've done your sprint and you go into the respect to, uh, retrospective and you evaluate what's actually happened and you usually do that in a very short period so just to get on and it's focus on very uh, few uh, points and, and some even say just one point. Mm -hmm. uh, but some, one of the teams that I work with actually said that we need one point additional. So not about what we're actually developing, but mm -hmm. about how did we work as a team? So they okay. added on that to the retrospective, continuously talking about how did this sprint work uh, as a team and then uh, with the, the actual task that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And just doing that, just put it into a, a structure where they continuously were uh, um, focusing on using each other's strengths and, and giving each other the feedback that helped the team develop. Yeah. And uh, I like so, that. So it's yeah. not uh, separate. It's actually an no. integral part of the process. It has to be. So we're it standing up, we're at the yeah. board, we're going through yeah. what needs to be done, and we're still yeah. using that language of Melbourne yeah. that really helps. One thing that's coming up quite a lot at the moment in, in, in the chat are the ways that 
different team roles um, mm. are able to work in this this manner. And I think you know one thing that came up right at the beginning is, is how do how do perhaps some of the more practical, perhaps some of the implementer, completer, finisher roles, mm. how do they cope working in quite a fast environment? Do they sometimes get a bit left behind or what's your, been your experience there? Well, my experience is the more that the, the team is prepared up front, the easier it is because that okay. they have those fallback plans that they can go to and okay, now we're moving that direction. I know we agreed that this is how we handled it. So I know what to do. So what typically happens if you have the, the same implementer or a complete finisher and you change the scope of the project mm. or uh, a completely new uh, project comes in from the right, uh, they will get frustrated because there's no uh, checklist, there's no yeah. uh, plan for what to do here. But if you prepare to be agile, and this <laughs> may sound really kind of productive, but preparing to be agile actually makes sure that they know what to do in this, in this situation when it happens. So be prepared. Yeah, be, pre be prepared. Uh, so for me, uh, with my roles, I would take that autonomous and uh, and the, the freedom and say, yeah, yeah, prepare all you want. I look at it when we're there uh, because it doesn't face me. I, I I don't get thrown off by okay, this is a new project, and yeah. I I can follow the things that we do. But for implementers and computer finishers, there's a lot of comfort in knowing what to do when we go into the unknown. So that would be part of any initial workshop that you had with an agile yeah. team. Yeah. That would be quite a big chunk of it, isn't it? It's saying yeah. like, we're going to get to this situation where you are going to feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, what should we do to negate that to ensure that you are still as effective? Exactly. And it's up to the scrum manager to, just to be aware of those profiles also, making sure that when we do these changes, not expecting everybody to be, yes, we're changing again. New scope and uh, this is agile, we love it. And and then four or five people sitting back and saying, okay, get another project we didn't finish or uh, <laughs> whatever happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so making sure, and this is uh, all the way back to having happy employees mm -hmm. and, 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 and making them stay is that they understand why we're changing and, and doesn't feel stressed about the change. And yeah. if you just take the Agile Manifesto, it it uh, basically requires that we everybody everybody is ready to do that, but they're not. Yeah. Just having it uh, on, yeah. on, on a piece of paper saying that we love changes, bring them on, doesn't really make the team love. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think what you're talking about a lot there, though, is all of this is dependent on really high levels of trust in a team, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, trust, because you've got to be able to know that everybody within the same Agile team as you is doing what they said they're going to do. They're doing it at the speed, at the quality. You can rely on them. You don't need to check. Because I suppose the second that you have a situation where people are checking up on the work, well, it's no longer... Well, that might be an issue, right? Yeah, uh, I think there might be. <laughs> yeah, there might be an issue. Or, or someone like me would say, yeah, have it. I'm 80% yeah, 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 yeah. done, so please. Please uh, take, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, so the thing is about the trust the thing, and, and, and you can say if uh, trust and being comfortable with the one you know uh, and the team members is, you can call it due diligence and or full disclosure or whatever, but just knowing at what level do the other people uh, deliver? Um, mm -hmm. Can I expect them to deliver uh, at what time in the, at the, in the day? And uh, when do they work in the day? Or uh, is it someone who always uh, leave the office, uh, office at three o'clock? Or is it mm -hmm. someone that works at night and they expect me to work at night? Uh, all these little things that actually is very, very important when you talk about working together as a team. Uh, how's my work ethic compared to yours and uh, how can we merge those so we don't get uh, get any conflicts or uh, it, we, nothing yeah. unexpected happens right 
Absolutely. It's a bit like that setting up to fail, isn't it? You're not expecting everything to line up. So if you're going to still be in the office at nine o'clock at night, yeah, I'm going to go at three o'clock. That would be lovely. Um, yeah. in, in the afternoon, it's not saying that I've got to stay there till nine. It's not saying that you have to finish at three. It's having that respect of understanding when those people are going to be there. It's not asking them to change, but be aware of those. Otherwise, you are just setting people up to, to always fail, aren't you? If yeah. you always send something at six o'clock, I ain't going to be there. No. You're always going to be disappointed in me. Yeah. Um, whereas at least if you know, and it's that communication, isn't it? Yeah. To be able to get that trust. And that's back to the initial, again, the freedom you get, right? So mm -hmm. if, if, if I act out of my own freedom saying, okay, I leave every day at three and the rest of the team expect that I answer emails at six, mm -hmm. then I'm misusing my freedom. Uh, and then it won't work. It won't no. be a success. Yeah. Uh, so the, Finding out what I need, finding out what the other needs, finding out how we can match those needs uh, is, is a very good thing uh, to help you succeed uh, with Agile or with any teamwork. Yeah. Um, and have that communication in there as well, because it's all well and good me knowing something. But yeah. unless you understand why it means so much to me and everything and why it's important, it's it's not going to, you gave a lovely example when we chatted the other day, Christopher, you gave lovely. a lovely, I've got so many bits of paper in front of me because we had chatted for absolutely ages. And you were saying about the importance um, of people understanding why something is so important to them. And you used the example. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you yeah. see, you looked blank I, I, there. I was out working at a, yeah. at a care home, uh, doing mm -hmm. a workshop with a care home uh, for uh, psychologically ill people. Mm -hmm. uh, so, or what's it called in English? It's it's yeah. more of a sort of mental health. It would be like yeah, mental health. Yeah, yeah mental health capacity. issues. Yeah, yeah. Some some was um, court ordered to stay there, and uh, others were there on their own uh, free will. But uh, so they were working at the, they had three teams taking care of three different groups of patients, mm -hmm. and then they had divided those three teams into. Uh, shifts from uh, 8 to 16, 16 to 24, and, uh, and 24 to uh, 8. And that meant that not all patients had a representative from the team at, uh, at any time, mm -hmm. any given moment. And one of the patients actually, and this came up at the discussion in, in, the, in the workshop we had, um, he was the, this typically tinfoil hat, uh, headphones, and you couldn't get in, in contact with him unless it was at two o'clock every uh, afternoon. So at every afternoon, he should have his tea and then you could come and talk with him in five minutes. And uh, not in, in those teams, they kept changing uh, employees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the, the issues that came up was that they didn't always get to him at two o'clock. So at two o'clock, this patient started whistling as, as a teapot. And uh, some of the new people uh, working there, they, they just thought, that's funny. Uh, it's hilarious. He's, mm. he's whistling every time at two, every day at two. But uh, as the person who had the most responsible uh, responsibility for him said uh, in the workshop, you, you all need to know that this, these five minutes are the only five minutes that we have contact with him in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So it's whatever else you're doing, you need to put that down and go to him at two o'clock uh, because he's scared. He needs yeah. that contact. And when he explained how important it was, the others started, okay, we understand that. And, and now it's not just funny that he's whistling. We know it's, uh, he's actually calling for yeah. us. Uh, he's calling for our help. So just the communication, telling why it's important for me that other people do that when I'm not there. Uh, and how that helps me succeeding with my uh, job and with my tasks, uh, just yeah, it's just good because it, it the the communication helps to just underscore the inter interdependence they have as teams yeah to make the thing yeah. work. So I love that example because I think it just illustrates how important people understanding the why. It's, yeah. it's not just the process, it's why is it important? Yeah. Building and spending time right at the beginning, perhaps an initial workshop to be able to discuss that. Or as you're saying, as you're going through, when you're going through these sprints, as you're um, reviewing things, yeah. this is what can, this needs to be done because of X, Y, or Z. And yeah. then again, it's that building that trust back into the team. 
And, and, and just connecting that back to the three or six or nine when you're leaving, if I have a valid reason and I share that with you for leaving at three o'clock, yeah. everybody will actually understand and accept Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so again, the more communication we can have, the more dialogue we can have about everything and nothing just helps us as a team to understand each other better, understand where we're coming from and how we as a team can get more out of the, what we're putting into it, right? Absolutely. And using the language of Belbin whilst we're doing that makes it just, um, makes it all beautiful. It is. Um, I'm just bringing over here a, 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 an organisation that I know you worked with um, a few years ago that being able to implement all of what you've just said, mm. you know, enabled them to make such a difference um, to their output, to the amount of time they were spending on all of these projects. In fact, I'm looking at this, they managed to shave us up like 20% of the hours normally spent on a project by yeah. really looking at their team, being able to have that communication and using using Belbin. Could you expand on, on the work you did there, Christopher? Because I think yeah, it really it's actually quite funny element. because uh, it, it was, uh, we started out with one project manager who mm -hmm. was shaper, 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 shaper. That was his profile, nothing else. Okay, yeah. And uh, he was, so not agile because he didn't he didn't coach anybody he just went in and said this is the way you do it and uh we got in contact with him and he he said it's not always working and i i need some help with this mm -hmm. and uh we certified him in belvin he loved belvin and uh imagine a, a shaper 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 using belvin it was still the same way you a specialist you do this and you so <laughs> But now there was a, some, some kind of structure uh, and, and we went in and, and helped him a little bit more about how we can actually facilitate the, the profiles and how we can facilitate this knowledge and we can get it more uh, out in the, in the team and, and use this. And one of the things that I did, I did a lot of personal coaching mm -hmm. and uh, uh, combined with this coaching, I went in to see some of the the standoffs he had with, with his team and uh, some of the retrospectives and so on and so on. And what I saw was that he was the only one speaking and none of the team members were saying anything. Even when he asked for their opinions, they didn't say anything. Nothing. Okay. Uh, and uh, so, so at one of the meeting I interrupted and asked, so what does it take? What, how, how much wrong should he be before you feel the need to say something. Should he be 50% wrong? Should he be 80% wrong? And just one of them just said, well, as long as he's like 70% or less, we'll fix it when we leave the meeting. It's okay, no problem. Okay. And, and what he really needed was the feedback because he, he needed to know where they were, how, how he could help uh, or uh, which way he should clear for them in the organization, how he should, should handle product owners and other stakeholders to make sure that they were actually delivering what they wanted to deliver. And uh, so we had a very good dialogue on why they needed to participate more in those meetings. And we're talking specialists, we're talking plants, we're talking uh, complete finishers, and it wasn't really natural. And they, the meetings they found was too long and too many, uh, but they found a way where they actually uh, find some common ground on how hip it's, uh, how much they should meet, how long the meeting should be, and uh, how much he should let them do himself, and when he should uh, interrupt and so on. And uh, finding our way and really making sure that they communicated on, on a regular basis and mm -hmm. about everything and could ask about anything. Uh, when he finished that project, it was estimated at 5,000 hours and he finished it after 4,000 hours. So that was the 20%. Mm -hmm. And uh, the 25% came when they had the after delivery uh, service. So typically when they delivered, there's still something that needs to be uh, corrected and so yeah, on. Yeah. Yep. And uh, they say 25% on that part. So the product they delivered were even better than they expected and still 20% under. Uh, so what happened was that we took all the project managers at that uh, company, uh, was, I think it was 20 per, uh, project managers, 
and went through the same uh, process again and really saved a lot of money in that organization. Wow. And, so that's, it, yeah. It, it, the funny part was just, it, it was nothing to do with product management. They had, everybody had have been through a lot of courses of product management and uh, they've, they've done agile, they've done uh, waterfall, they've done whatever. And um, what it really was about was how they communicated, how, how to work together as a team. Time and time again. So I saw in, in, the, in the chat, in, in the top of the chat, somebody mm -hmm. said that agile is more about culture and uh, in the company than anything else. And that's correct. It's about that culture making it uh, or demanding that we work together as a team and, and giving that the, giving them the tools and giving them the space to work as a team. Yeah. And not just saying work as a team and fix it. And I think this goes to everything, doesn't it? It is that communication, but it's building the culture that allows people to do that. I'm mm -hmm. just going to go off topic just for a second. Would you mind, yeah. please, if you are commenting, um, to make sure this chat setting goes to all panellists and attendees? Um, otherwise, Vicky can't see what you're saying and she won't be able to answer you. And she's like, I want to, I want to help, but you need to do that settings to all um, panellists and attendees, please. Um, that's thrown me a little bit, but I'll get back um, to that. No, I think the, I think I now though, more. okay. I, 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 which is quite funny because one of one of the things I've seen uh, with Agile and some of the other uh, uh, manifestos or, or, or ways to work in, in, in projects is that it's like working with profiles. Uh, it can become a little bit religious. I love okay. this one, but not that one. Or yeah. we can discuss these things. Uh, and what I found is that when you come into a situation where they are either discussing whether or not they should be agile or uh, whether or not they should use this kind of uh, programming language or this kind, or if they should set the server up this way or that way, um, just clearing which kind of team roles are speaking at that moment just helps clear up the whole mess because Typically, they'll be the same and there will be no action goals. So they're focusing on, on theoretics more than actually getting the job done. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's more about uh, perhaps a bit of the old thinking, well, this is what I know. I want to tell everybody um, what I know and um, looking at that theory as opposed well, yeah, to just, it, come it on, let's get like it done. It conflict from the outside, but actually it's just an interesting discussion. Yeah. No, absolutely that shouldn't take place yeah i think right now as well you know we're working in um more virtual worlds aren't we i mean mm. the one thing about what agile working is very much about the individuals it's also it talks a lot about face-to-face -face working and we don't have so much of of that available to us now and in the uk we don't have any of it available as of tomorrow mm. um how do you think that's going to affect i mean are there any ways which we can ensure that people still manage to have that amount of time together when working so quickly and so rapidly i mean do you have any recommendations there keep in contact yeah yeah, yeah. keep in contact uh, and and if you're the scrum master just, just make sure that you're in in in, in uh, daily contact with with the team members uh and and that the team members talk between themselves. You don't need to be there all the time. Everybody doesn't need to be there all the time. Just make sure that the line of communication is open. Yeah. Um, okay. And, and having that, that trust yeah. that people are actually doing what they say they're oh, going yeah. to oh, yeah. do. I, it's I, this I trust at all times, isn't customers. it? Yeah, I just talked to one of my customers where they actually said that uh, they were 25% in production just by going home, uh, working from home. They were up 25%. It was oh, much easier for them to control. Yeah, because nobody interrupted them and uh, the marketing and product owners and whatever, they, they didn't have the, the time to come in or they, 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 couldn't, they, mm -hmm. they didn't disturb them. So the production went way up. I know that's what they keep telling me over in the programming um, department yeah. here. They keep yeah, saying exactly. we can get so much done there because you're not here. And I try not to take it personally, um, but obviously I do. Um, one thing about Agile is um, we talk about failing fast. 
Mm. And I think uh, this is quite an important one. So if you're working with a team, uh, there's trust that you've developed. You've done a lot of groundwork to start with. And mm. I think this is really where we're getting to. It's the work you do at the beginning, which is going to help everything else yeah. um, go there. Is we also need to learn, don't we? Because we can keep failing and that's fine, but we need to learn from those failures. Mm. Can you give us some advice about how you would recommend people learning from that? Well, when you do respect, uh, retrospective, uh, the only way you can get really value out of the retrospective is when people trust each other so much that they admit to the failures. They want to talk okay. about their yeah. failures. Mm -hmm. uh, so. If I don't trust you, I don't feel comfortable about you. I'm not going to share. Yeah. Not mine. I may comment on yours. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I'm not going to share mine. Uh, and and so that's back to the groundwork, making sure that we don't only feel comfortable talking about what's good, mm -hmm. but we also feel comfortable about talking about what happened when it went wrong, because we know that will help the team get to where they need to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, in order to get the learning out of the failure, you need to have the trust built into the team. You need to have that they're comfortable about it, that they uh, want to share and, and that they've thought about them, it them themselves. And they also know that when people say something about it, that it's not personal, but they're actually helping to understand what went wrong. And I suppose this helps again using the Belbin language, um, because what we need to be able to do is identify exactly where we've got wrong. But sometimes, like I say, even if you have trust, people sometimes still don't like to um, say, yeah, yeah, that was me. But mm. being able to use the Belbin team as, as a, a language to say, for, for example, if we never ask the monitor evaluator for their input, we always will fail at this point. Mm. So it's work out why did we fail because we never do ask for a monitor evaluator's um, opinion um, at, the, at the right time and we'll continue to not answer therefore we'll continue to be wrong. So let's just try and use that Belbin language as well to identify those areas where it's not quite going as expected. Yeah so, so again people are a process but we still know to got to know or need to know where in the process did we go wrong Yeah. to identify what needs to be done. So yes People are all process, but yeah. that doesn't mean that we have no process. No, no, the process is yeah. important and it's there to be understood and explained um, very much so. Okay, I'm just gonna look at some more questions here. Oh, there's so many. This is, oh, Vicky, yeah. thank you for doing such a wonderful job. This is, um, this has been absolutely fabulous. What about other team roles? How do they, how do, how do they um, roll out? Or is it always just the same advice? If you understand the input, if you understand the creature, the animal, right at the very beginning, you can plan for that. Hmm. So every team role has equal amount of impact, do you think, within an agile team? Question uh, for me? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, it, it depends on where you are in, in, in the project, right? Uh, yeah. Like every, everything else. Uh, but I think it, the coordinator it has an important role in the Agile team, making sure that uh, the people are focused on the target, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the, the shaper making sure that we are moving as fast as possible without uh, uh, just uh, stressing people. Yeah. And, and and so we can take the, the, the natural and and every single role and and they have a natural role in in in, in agile teams. Uh, or, or else we won't work. This this is back to the basic built-in yeah. team role theory. Um, so I think what we talk a lot about with with my customers when we talk about agile teams and and and, and team roles is. The most important thing is for the, each person to know when their team role is a positive contribution to bring the team forward. Yeah. It's not just knowing what roles you play, it's knowing when to play them. When to play for them. For the team. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. An interesting question here from Graham, actually. Um, are ground rules then established and agreed? So you're we're talking about doing that work right at the very beginning. Um, and it, I love the way that you do that. Let, let's observe the team. Mm. 
Mm. Let's go through the profiles. Let everybody take ownership for their Belbin team and saying how they prefer to work. They feed everything back. Um, so you're developing this element of trust. Um, to be able to have a one-to-one -one as well, I think is always a good idea with the, if there is a manager um, involved at that point. Being able to tag on talking and reviewing the team um, whenever you're talking about the work. So talking about the team becomes part of the, the work conversation um, when you're um, reviewing things. Do these things all need to, they all need to be agreed and almost signed to, do you think? Or is there a bit of fluidity as well with that? I, personally, I would prefer the fluidity. Okay. Uh, I, I think you can make team contracts and uh, you can write everything down, but you kind of miss the point doing that. Okay. Because we're focusing on the trust. We're focusing, focusing on the tacit agreement that we, we know where we need to go. And if we, at some point, disagree, we talk about it. We have the dialogue about why we disagree at the spot where we actually disagree. Mm -hmm. We're not going back to some document where we, we said we couldn't leave at four, before four, and you left at three. Why did you do that? Yeah. Uh, doesn't bring anything positive to the table. So more, let's have that uh, discussion about how we want to work. Let's yeah. keep having that discussion. Let's he keep having that dialogue that's way more beneficial than uh, writing down team contracts and team rules. And actually, you talking about this, me asking, you know, I almost wanted to give an answer then, as I tend mm. to. I've always been at school. I've always been the one with my <laughs> hand up. Uh, yes, me, please pick me. Yeah. The key thing here, and I can't believe it's taken us to now to talk about it, is actually the size of teams. Because yeah. if you've got a team of 27, one, it's not agile. Um, but you do need more rules. But actually... What would your size of team ideal be if you're working with agile teams? No, I, I just saw Phil's uh, comment here in the, in the chat. And oh, like, like you said, uh, seven plus uh, minus th three or, or two, according to different people. And uh, what was Jeff Bezos says, no more than can be fed by two pizzas. Mm -hmm. um, it must be American style pizzas then. Uh, but I would say, you can put a number on it, yeah. but as soon as you feel trust slipping, as soon as you feel uh, people not being comfortable, then it's getting too big. Or then you need to address those and find out, is it the team size that's uh, causing it the slippage or is it something else? Uh, yeah. So I wouldn't care if you have a team of 20, if you can establish that trust because at 20, like Oof. Philbin almost said, they will divide into smaller teams. Anyway. Yeah, they will do. They will do. Uh, so that would be the natural way to do it. Mm. Uh, but seven plus three would be 10. I still think that would be too big in a in an agile team. Yeah. I would probably say, like Philbin always said, like around the five, yeah. three, four, five, he five. says, but the five like tops and, and focus on that. I've seen really, really strong teams. I had, you won't believe it. it's really great team. Uh, a, a, the government department working with a mission critical software. They developed it 25 years ago. These two guys still working on it, been working on it every year. And it's very influenced by politician decisions. So every year that comes, or, or every half year, there comes a new decision and they have to change the software. They've been doing okay. that for 25 years. Same two guys been working on that for 25 years. And now they decided, okay, now we need to redo the whole program. It's mission critical for the government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, they put in a, uh, a scrum master and he understands what he has here. Those two people that have been working together for 25 years, they know each other better than they know their own families. Uh, they know exactly how they work. So he doesn't interfere anything. He just, he's just controlling the stakeholders, uh, the product owner, uh, the politicians. Okay, so everybody everything. on the periphery, yeah. Yeah, just making sure that they follow the plan they agreed, making sure that uh, they have the daily stand-up, uh, they, they do the short sprints, mm. and they have a contingency uh, time if something happens. And I met them when they've been doing it for half a year, and they hadn't used any of that contingency time yet. And uh, they were just like, 
we have nothing to talk about. But this is great. Everything's working because yeah. I know Bjarne, and Bjarne knows me, and uh, Peter is taking Bjarne. care of everything else. Thank that you. Was, that was two plus one, right? Yeah. No, absolutely. I actually had a long discussion with Meredith yesterday. He came into the office and um, we had a good old natter. And I asked him this question because Phil had already mm. emailed in saying, please talk about team size. And I said, right, Meredith, these are, you know, agile teams and we we're talking about things. And he said, I stick to four. Yeah. He said, and the reason why it's four is because it's an even number. And if you want true okay. consensus, yeah. you don't need somebody taking you know, the final, final vote, yeah. that final yeah. decision. Yeah. It shouldn't be on what. So if you're truly working yeah. as a collaboration, it needs to be an even number. But he always says four for that. But then he did, as is Meredith, who's 94 now, and my goodness, is still so sharp. Uh, but we did meander a little bit. But he started talking, as you've just done, on the importance of working relations of twosomes. It's that duality. Yeah. And once yeah. you get that working together, so if you can have within your agile team two twos, or he said maybe three twos, mm. that is also incredibly positive. And that's where Belbin, and as you were saying right at the beginning, comes in. Yeah. is really finding out our opposites, finding out our conflict zones. What do yeah. we do to ensure that we don't get to that conflict and we stay to that open conversations? Um, so team size is always really, really interesting. And yes, Jose, it is very much team versus group. You don't want group think when you're working in agile teams. You want people to still have their individual contributions, exactly. don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. But um, I, was also, I would also agree with Phil because... What he's saying about the, the consensus and not, not consensus yeah. and agile teams don't need consensus. Yeah, but you still need to agree on why you're not agreeing and, yeah. and how you're not agreeing. Mm. Uh, mm. So knowing each other, uh, the better you know each other, the better you can disagree. And, and you can even scream at each other if you know each other because you know it's not personal. Yes. That's, uh, so, and it's not just being... Uh, okay, that's Christopher. No, no, it's I understand what Christopher is actually trying contrib to contribute with, and I understand why he's saying it that way, and we need to talk about it. So that that's how you uh, make sure there's no conflicts. Uh, you make sure that uh, we're still focusing on on what we need to focus on. Mm -hmm. And to the point about the three twosomes, that's also really good and really great. But what you need is also those three twosomes to talk together. So to rotate. So you still need well. the communication. Yeah. So you can you can be a group of twenty with ten teams of two. Yeah. But in order to that to get that to really work, you still need that communication going between the teams. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I love what Phil said, actually, is um, you have a relationship with someone, you have stand up arguments and people thought that they hated each other, but actually they really didn't. You know, no, no. and shiver, you know, shiver. yeah, just coming to the Melbourne office, you should have had me and Nigel earlier. My God. Uh, <laughs> but it's okay because it's just that we both come from very, very different viewpoints and mm. understanding that and still having that respect and everything. But you want people to disagree, yeah. um, don't you, for things to move forward. But yeah, it's just back to those relationships. It's the communication again and again. But again, understanding why we're disagreeing. So I won't, it's not to the team's benefit if I can continuously just disagree because I can't disagree. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I, I, I have to understand that disagreeing is about whether or not this is moving us forward or not. Yeah. Uh, so you don't want to be stuck the there, prize. do you? Yeah. Eyes on the prize. Just yeah. why am I contributing with this right now? Mm -hmm. yeah. And again, back to the start. Who are we? What are we going to do? How are we going to work together? Don't need to write it down but we need to agree on how to share it. Absolutely. And it does sound easy, but when we're, it's a fair yeah. point here. Um, when working, especially with the international intercultural teams, mm. when you've not worked together before, it's much harder. And my advice would be, you have to spend a lot longer and mm. work hard at right at the very beginning. Um, but, and you also have to put in, put in the effort to actually start to learn about the culture of different countries. You can talk yeah. about Denmark and Sweden. We are like we literally this close. I can nearly just swim over, right? Yeah. The Swedes are so consensus seeking that you won't believe it. So they, okay. they would typically say yes, 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 yes. And as a Dane, we just, okay, yeah, you agree, perfect. We are nowhere near seeking 
to be in consensus with anybody. So yeah. we're very different in the way we work professionally. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and, uh, and you need to address those things. Uh, and as a scrum master, if you have different cultures, you need to pick up on those and just see what happens combined with the team roles. Yeah. Okay. So it's not looking at just team roles, not looking at just culture, looking at a combination of those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and having the conversations. When exactly. you have people right at the very beginning talking about their team role strengths, why not also add in there a bit about yeah. their culture, about how they prefer to work as well as the team roles? And this will help. All of these things, it's the more you communicate, the more you understand. The more you develop those relationships within the team, everything becomes easier. As long as you keep at that throughout yeah. the whole process, don't just have it as a one-off. Keep addressing it. Keep having those dialogues going. Yeah, and 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 uh, have in the in the retrospectives have at the start have at any given time. If there's anything you don't understand, talk about it. Yeah. Uh, you should be it, talking it about difficult. it in agile teams, but if you're working, talking about, you know, teams who are small, you know, mm. small teams who are working together frequently, who are working by communicating and with others, that communication should become a little bit easier, perhaps. Or do we have what we hear, the iceberg analogy where people are just at the top, you know, you're just communicating there, you're not getting to that, that bottom bit. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. Our time's up. It's four o'clock. I know it three o'clock cultural okay. difference. Yeah. Yeah. But I've got no, 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 no. far more work to do this afternoon yeah. than you have. <laughs> if you could give everybody one bit of practical advice to help with their teams, looking at all of the work that you've done over 25 years of working with teams, Christopher, what would it be? Come again. Just one, one bit of practical advice. Yeah. One piece of advice for everybody yeah. To say, God, yeah, amazing wisdom there from Christopher. What would that I don't be? Think, I don't know if it's amazing wisdom, but taking to heart that have the, uh, each um, uh, have each uh, team member present and take uh, ownership of their own profile. So the more you can have them presenting what's in the profile, not reading it, but their perception of what they read. Yeah strength and what they think could be better the more that they can put into their own words to the other people in the team the better taking ownership taking ownership and being willing to share perfect yeah. thank you very much christopher and that's just, one, just 